Call this meeting to order, please. Yeah, 606. Sorry, it's uh, six minutes late. We'll just be here six minutes later tonight. <laughs> Uh, first, um, we have a couple presentations. I'll turn it over to Patty or Lynn for the first presentation. Point of order. Yeah. We called, but Union 38 did not call. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Ooh, good point. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, play Kent Cutterback tonight and call the uh, Union 38 meeting to order. Thank you. That's Next chair. <clears throat> Can I ask why David's doing it? Uh, Ken's out. Ken will be here until a little later. And how do we choose who's the next person? Would you like to do it? Sure. Uh, if you'd like to. I, I mean, I'm, I'm just asking the question. There, there, there's the no particular reason except that uh, Ken told us he was going to be late, and so I'm happy to, happy to do it. But I have no uh, ownership interest in this whatsoever. There's no <laughs> nefarious plan. Uh, Does and, Union 38 have a vice? Uh, I don't think they did. That's why. So they just said, you do it. But I'm happy to switch seats if you'd like. Why don't you do this, Cindy? Yeah. Well, we could do it by acclamation if we want. Somebody has to open and close and sort of move it along, I think, for the union. So And take notes, either. And rather, take note, rather than reschedule it uh, till Ken shows up. Just happy to... Do we have the ETA uh, I think maybe 45 minutes or something. Well, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of new at this, but maybe we should at least um, approve that you're doing it or nominate others, you know, sort of have a vote of some sort. I, I did ask Ken um, a couple different times um, about chair. He's retiring where he is, and I asked him what kind of capability he's going to be doing and working with the thing. And he seems like he still wants to do, you know, help out whenever he can still be chair unfortunately he has other obligations um, we do not have a vice chair that that i know of i'm on union 38 also and frontier so i'm a former chair huh? jamie eisler used to do it when ken cut it back with no 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 wrong chair but, but one, you're, at well one, at one, yeah. you're well versed. You're well versed. Bobby, you could at, do both. Uh, at one time, I did both. That one time when Regina was here, I was Union 38 chair and Frontier chair. Point I want to do that again, but it's as easy as asking for a motion, so we can move this along. It's not even okay. It's got to be Union motion. I make a motion that David Sharp steps in temporary till King gets here to be chair of Union 38. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All Union. Okay, what's. Can you raise your hands again, please? Seven. Not me. Against? One. Stain? Two. So pass. Now, like, now we're going to have a couple pre nice presentations, and I'll turn it over to Lynn and Daddy. Uh, good evening. Um, thanks for having us here tonight. Um, I wanted to uh, bring forward our new food service director. Her name is Mary DeLusa and um, she's going to talk about her plans and her visions for the program. Um, and so Mary, if you'd like to just stand and try to project loudly. Hi everybody, thank you so much for giving me time in your meeting today to go over our school lunch program. I kind of wanted to start on a high note and just give out a couple of appreciations. First and foremost, I would just like to appreciate all of the women who work in our cafeterias. They have gone above and beyond since I've taken over. Um, they've really stepped up to all of the challenges I presented to them and all of the challenges that this school year has presented. And they have just come out for the better. It have been amazing, super help, and they make me look good. So thank you so much to the women. There's a few of them here tonight. Thank you so much. to the principals in all five of our schools. They've really been a 
support system to me. I'm very new to this position. They've been patient, you know, they've answered questions. They've listened to my crazy ideas because I have a lot of them. And they've been a huge support and, and an assistance to me in the four months that I've been doing this, or five, four or five. Um, so thank you guys very much for your time and your support. I really, it's really much appreciated. Um, I'll try to keep this short and sweet. I made a list of a lot of the new things that we've been doing in our school district since I took over in November. Um, one of my goals and one of my continued goals is to open up communication with parents and to really you know, keep them in the loop about their students' balances, what's going on with the cafeteria, allow them to have a voice, and really to allow them to have access to myself and to our program. Um, so I know there's a few parents in the room here um, that could attest to it, but we've put out a newsletter once a month, every month since I've started. It's a district-wide newsletter. It features local farmers, um, homemade delicious things that are happening in our kitchens. It's got information about the free and reduced lunch program, a cafeteria mission statement, as well as all of my contact info for parents. In addition to that, we've started putting out monthly balance updates to all of our parents, letting them know if their student has a negative balance or a positive balance, um, eliminating room for a lot of error that was missed with no communication or a lack of communication. And that's been super helpful, and we've seen a lot of positivity from that. Um, a few other things that we're doing to um, boost student participation is kids choice menu planning. We've introduced this in all four of our elementary schools since I started. It's by grade so each month one grade receives a ballot and they vote on what's going to go on our school lunch menus. Um, I did give some packets to our principals to hand out to individual school committees so they can see the menu, how bright, how colorful it is. Um, but each day that's a kids choice option says kids choice on there and let's you know let's them know that their voice is being heard and we're serving the food that we want like they want to see you know we want to feed the kids what they want to eat um, in addition to that we're getting ready to launch a student survey at Frontier because I don't think the ballot um, option is really a great idea for Frontier so we're getting ready to do an online survey I'm just putting together all of the marketing for that I guess there's something called the QR code so they could take a picture and do the survey on the spot. So I'm trying to get that all set up um, just so that it's fun and it's hip for the kids so that they're having a voice too. You know, they could go have pizza or they could go have Subway right down the street and we really want to get those kids here and having lunch with us. And we want to make it better than our competition down the street, you know. Um, in addition to that, to increase staff participation, Three out of our five schools are doing Friday staff lunch specials. Conley is our third school. They're getting ready to launch their staff special Fridays tomorrow, which is very exciting. So if you're in Conley, please order some lunch. Um, we do it at Frontier as well as Deerfield, Waitley, and Sunderland have outstanding staff participation. Um, but I'm sure we can launch it in those schools as well. Um, so those are kind of all the things we're doing to increase student and staff participation. My long-term goal is to always increase, you know, increase our numbers, increase our participation, increase the quality of food that we're doing. Um, those things are for that. Um, also, I've been meeting once a month with our principals in each of the schools. We discuss, you know, my financial numbers. We discuss um, outstanding student debt, which is something that you know we need to address as a district. Um, all of my ideas and things like that. From those um, meetings, we've been able to start doing a system where we have the principals or their secretaries call the parents of children that have $50 or more debt in their school lunch accounts. And we've seen a ton of positivity on this. Um, since I took over, I think in, it was around November or December, we had a little over $11,000 in unpaid lunch dues. And today I checked it and we had um, about $9,600 and we've seen a ton of positivity in the schools for this particularly in Sunderland in November and December they accounted for over half of our student lunch debt and there are around they are at currently around $3,800 in student lunch debt which is a huge improvement it was about $7,000 when we started so we've seen a ton of positivity um, in contacting the parents um, a few of the fun things that we're doing is partnering with local farms. Right now we just started a new partnership with Joe Sikowski Farms, which is in Hadley. We're getting ready to start partnering with Atlas Farms again because they have a, they're going to have a larger 
priceless and variety of produce because the season is changing and we're really excited to bring some local organic produce into our schools. We currently partner with Pine Hill Orchards for our apples and Parkdale fruit farms as well. Um, a few other things to address is my training and um, my growth. Since I've just taken over this position and I'm new to the food service director position, I've been trying to partner with outside groups to further my learning, um, to give me good ideas, to help me have sound business practices. Um, I've partnered with John C. Stocker Institute. They do the Smarter Lunchroom Scorecard. Um, so we have a coach who came to Frontier to evaluate us for our fresh fruits and vegetables and how to market that better to our students. She really loved everything that we're doing. Obviously, there's always room to improve. So I was able to create an action plan based on the scorecard that works for our school, for all of our schools, that is easy to accomplish and I'll be able to have good results for her when she returns in May. And we also worked with um, Northbound Ventures. Uh, Franklin Regional Council of Governments received a grant um, to do, um, I think it's called School Nutrition Best Practices. And Holly Fowler of Northbound Ventures was able to come into our school at no cost. She went to Sunderland and evaluated their breakfast and lunch program and is putting together a packet for us to you know, tell us what we're doing good, to share with other schools, but also to point out ways that we could be doing better because we always wanna be doing better for our kids. I have a one-year-old, so <laughs> I have to think about it in the long-term perspective. Am I gonna feed him this food when he's the age of your children? And I would like to say yes, I would. <laughs> Um, lastly, a couple of things that I want to highlight as successes in our school district is that, um, as Patty will be able to tell you, she has some handouts for you. We have been able to successfully lower food costs. We're continuing to work with our vendors to get the best pricing for our, our items that we need to purchase, um, as well as able to negotiate with some of our other vendors, like our propane company, to lower our costs. Um, all of the people in our school that are, all of the people in our kitchens that are taking responsibility and helping with ordering and things like that are really helping me to put together a more, they're basically we're shopping smart. We're looking through all of our items, we're looking through all of our bids, we're making sure we're getting the best price for our value and we're trying to purchase as you know cheaply as we can but not sacrifice the quality. Um, the last two things I have is our meals per service hour, which Patty also has approved up for you guys. Um, when we had Jim, I believe Jim Halstead was his name, came in and evaluated all of our programs last year to see kind of what was going on and what the issue was. He had us at an average of 7.8 meals per service hour. And since I've taken over in November, our district as a whole is at a 9.2. When I took over the position, I understood that I was supposed to at least try and get us up to 10 meals per service hour by the end of the school year. And I'm happy to report that most of three, I believe it's three of our schools, are at least at a 10 every month, if not higher. And some schools have even seen as high as 12 to 15. So the meals per service hour is going up. Um, lastly, I did pass out a handout around the table. There's not a lot. We have a handful of women who have always taken responsibility in our schools, who have always, you know, helped get the order together, check in the order, go through the government commodities. Basically the right hand person to the food service director who was here before. Um, so what we're proposing is a job description to give them a title, to give them an official position and a salary scale, which is on the back of that page. Um, you might have to share. Um, I know you're not voting on it tonight, but there's a handout for you to consider in a salary, a salary pay scale. Um, is there any questions or comments, or I don't know how it works, but <laughs> I'll it up. I'd just like to qualify. When we were talking about the school lunch program, we had told you that we would be bringing the proposal from the team leaders in January. And this is the proposal because this was the, the, re, uh, the recommended structure for the program with one overseeing food service director because she couldn't be in five schools at all times. So we're bringing this for your review. It will be on your um, May agenda to vote. Um, so I just wanted to say that. I just wanted to comment. I just wanted to thank you for all the work you've done. Thank and, you. And your dad. Oh, thank you. They're awesome. If you guys have lunch with them, please let them know because they work really hard.
Thank you very much for your Thank time. You. Thank you. Thank you. Got any questions? Bob? The uh, service team leader. It's new to me. All right. Um, where are we going to find the money? 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 Where program reviewed this was the proposed structure we talked about after hiring the director we would be bringing this to you in January so this it we're a little we're a couple months late bringing it to you but this is the proposed new structure that each school will have one food service director one team leader and then how many cafeteria people so they were having a full-time basically or seven hour day position for a team leader they already they would have. share the food service director they would what? Share the food service. We, we are sharing it, yes. Okay. And my, my question basically is, is this person going to replace somebody that's already nope. on staff? So this is going nope. to add an additional layer. Somebody's already in the schools doing that job every day. But that was my question. They, yes. are, they already exist. They, they, just giving them, just giving them somebody. Somebody's going to have a title. We're not going to end up with another body. Correct. Correct. We're just that, giving them the title. That's the way I understood what you said. Yes. No, everybody, every school already has one of these people. They just, we've never formalized the position, and that's what we're trying to do. I just want to make sure we're not adding to the position. No. We're just changing the title of one of the parties. The Correct. person who does take the responsibilities is going to be given the title team leader. But my point is, we're not adding additional staff. Again, no, no, we are not. There's yeah. already a person in each of the buildings doing this job. No additional people will so be hired. I think you guys are in agreement. <laughs> Any other questions? Anybody? Thank you. Yeah, that was okay. a great Thank presentation. You. Thank you so Thank you. much. Next, I'd like to have Karen Ferrandino, Ferrandino, the Director of Special Ed, get up and just give us a quick update on our Special Education Task Force. They've been working all year, been working with Karen and a consultant, Sharon Jones, from the Collaborative, and I'd just like an update. I brought it to you several times, but thank you, Karen. Hi, I uh, know most of you, for those of you who are new faces. My name is Karen Ferrandino. I'm the Director of Special Education. Patty just told me to talk louder. Usually people don't have to tell me to talk louder. So I will. Uh, before I get into the task force, one of the other things that uh, Dr. Carey asked me to just touch base with uh, is if you know special education, a lot of time and commitment goes into compliance. It's not very exciting, but the team here, the administrators, the faculty, everybody spends a lot of time on compliance and making sure we have systems that just up and run so we don't have to spend a lot of time and resources worrying about being in compliance. Just to give you an idea how that works is every six years, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education comes in and does uh, pretty much an audit. They call it a coordinated program review on 55 criteria. Um, this year we're doing what we call a mid-cycle review. We're right in the middle of that six years, so we did a mid-cycle review. They come in and they look at the things that you were found to be in partial compliance or non-compliance uh, three years ago. It wasn't many of them because you have a very strong district and is up and running, but I'm happy to inform you today that four of your five schools were found in 100% compliance. We have no corrective action plans. We have nothing that they found to even be in partial compliance. For anybody who knows special education, that's uh, quite an accomplishment. So I, I really just want to acknowledge the faculty and the team that were able to do that. Here in the larger school, we only had two things that we do have to forms that we didn't have filled out 100% of the time and it will be an easy correction. So I just want to note how well when we're looking at uh, building programs and building systems to take care of students, all our time and energy can go into that because of how well we do the compliance part. Um, so moving on, at the beginning of this school year, it was kind of noted, wow, you know, we have a pretty incredible special education program. We have pretty incredible schools. No student in the elementary schools is placed out of district. Um, they, all, all of them are supported here within our district and started to look at um, the progress that we've made here at special education and working collaboratively with the general education and the principals and the school systems as a whole 
and said, what if we spent time and resources putting together a task force? And that task force goal was really to put together what we call a strategic plan. And we'll be bringing you that strategic plan after you hear a little bit about it tonight. Um, it's not typed up. But they brought in, uh, the district brought in Sharon Jones from the Collaborative of Educational Services, used to be the Hampshire Educational Collaborative. And there's been a team of about 15 educators throughout the district from every school meeting. Uh, we've met about six times for about three hours. It's, again, led by Sharon Jones. And the idea was, we're going to set a vision. We're going to do a strategic plan. It's never really been done before. It's not done in many school systems in which they really spend the time and energy to say, we really want to focus on what our foundation is, what we do really well, what is our vision for the next five years or so, and how are we going to make a plan to get there? And again, that's recognizing that we have a very strong foundation. What we really want to do is, how do we, what I call, stay ahead of the wave? How do we keep moving forward? When you're working at this high level of no students out of district, you don't want to just keep maintaining, because eventually you're going to get a little turbulence, and it's going to get messy. So we really had to set our sights on the future. Um, the very first thing we did is set a vision. I'm just going to tell it to you tonight. The vision of our school district in special education is to decrease the impact of the disability while increasing participation in the natural environment. Okay. So it was time to stop just thinking about services, stop just thinking about IEPs, and really thinking what is it that we're doing for students. And what we're doing for students, again, is decreasing the impact of the disability while increasing participation in the natural environment. But we weren't done. That's not the only vision. The other vision is to do that collaboratively through one system of support. Okay? So what we're saying there is now that we know where we really want our students to be, how are you going to do that? We're going to develop a system of support in which all our educators, all our administrators, everybody works collaboratively to, through one system of support to meet the needs of all our students. We really do do that. It's time, though, to set it out there as a vision in which everybody can identify with. Uh, that really starts to mean that we don't want general education and special education to be seen as two split programs. Simultaneously, we want to make sure we have the supports and services in there to offer a continuum of services for our special education students, if that made sense. Um, again, reiterating that we have a strong foundation. So we really looked at the fact that we have this incredible foundation. We now have this vision. Well, the plan is, how do we get from our strong foundation to our vision? These 15 educators spent a lot of their time, energy, through the leadership of Sharon Jones and working collaboratively to really identify three key areas to really get to that vision. Parent participation and involvement. Yeah. That takes an effort by all, you know, it takes an effort by parents who are very busy, especially parents with uh, students with special needs. It's pretty stressful. Uh, things you don't even think about, you know, it's hard enough to find a child care, but when your child can't just have your typical child care. How do we really work together to have our parents involved? The other thing we discovered that we really want to focus on is this is a district that's really focused on inclusion and working collaboratively and understand that collusion does collusion. Where did that come from? <laughs> <laughs> um, inclusion uh, doesn't uh, necessarily mean one, one way to look at things. Inclusion is actually a continuum of supports and services, right? So you have to have a continuum to ensure that students are included at the level in which are appropriate for them. Um, so we identified parent involvement. We in identified collu collusion, inclusion, <laughs> inclusion. And we also identified something that's very Maybe if you tweet it, it'll come up. <laughs> that's good. OK, we also identified multi-tiered systems of support. Okay, multi-tiered system of support is a way in which you look at things where you actually have interventions and tiered interventions. These group of 15 educators are committed to working not just this year, but working in a special task force to bring both general educators, reg general educators, special educators together to continue this work. So we're really building this system. So I want to thank everybody for the idea to bring in Sharon Jones. I look at Kim McCarthy, who's actually on the task force, uh, the administrative team that came up with the idea to bring somebody in to help lead us to do this um, incredible work. Uh, that is your task force. It will result in a strategic plan that you will actually be able to see. Uh, it won't have the word collusion anywhere in it, uh, I hope. Uh, 
and it's, it's, it's exciting stuff. So we wanted an opportunity to bring you this information. Again, you'll see the plan. It will be an ongoing effort, and uh, it's really an opportunity to ensure that we just keep moving forward, and we move forward with a vision that helps us all to understand our roles and how we can all work together to achieve our goals. Questions? Yeah. How many years have we been keeping all our kids in the district, not going out of district? How many years would you? Is it just a good year that that we're having that we have all the kids in our district stay in our district? I can say that since I've been here for my six years, there has not been one child under the age of sixth grade that's been out since uh, since my arrival. To be completely transparent, we. Uh, Three out of the four elementary schools have all their students in their building. There are two students in one of our elementary schools that are not in their building. They're in another building in our district. And that happened many years ago, four years ago, five years ago, when we developed a brand new program at Sunderland to start it up. So I'd say it was five years ago. Uh, when that program developed. But since that time of that initial cohort going over to start the new program in Sunderland, no student has been moved out of a, uh, an elementary school. I think that's, so it's been I think five that's wonderful. years awesome. since we've actually yeah, done wonderful. that. So much. It's phenomenal. I mean, other districts don't, yeah. don't have this. And again, it's, it's the work of the people in the schools and the administrative team with its vision to continue to put the effort into that and all of you. Any other questions for Karen? When do you think the strategic plan will be presented, and when would you foresee uh, the specific implementation of that plan? Are you looking for like next year, okay. next September, or sometime, sometime thereafter? Uh, again, the strategic plan is really going to identify our strengths and then our area of focus. It's going to really clearly identify what our vision is, and then it's going to develop avenues, um, articulate avenues to get to that vision. And there's going to be those three avenues. Yeah. Uh, the written plan, and actually say it, Sharon and I were really going to do that over April break. Well, that's like a week and a half away. Um, so we're hoping to do that, but the uh, task force asked for one more meeting together to really identify maybe what work we can start this summer, what we can start early, and develop a timeline for the work we want to continue doing. So I'd say that the, the plan could be presented as early as May um, in its written format. And I would anticipate that when we bring you the plan, it's going to say something like, this is what we anticipate to achieve in one year, this is what we anticipate to achieve in three years, and this is what we anticipate to achieve in five years. Any other questions for Karen? Bill? Nope. Just like to say thank you. That was awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Before we do approve minutes, I should have done this at first. I mean, there's some new people at the table. Um, start with myself. We're going to say who you are, where you're from, because I, I do recognize, don't recognize a couple uh, faces here. So I'm Bob Hallett, Chair of Frontier and also at Whitley Elementary. Dave Sharp, Chair of Deerfield School Committee. Bob Decker, Frontier. Bill Smith, Whitley at Frontier. Mary Raven, Deerfield at Frontier. Bill Cantor, Conway at Frontier. Keith McFarland, Sunderland, and Frontier. Uh, Bill Mayer, PC, Frontier. Lynn Roberts, Frontier. Judy Pierce, Frontier. Cindy Wamat, Frontier. Jan Flaska, Deerfield. And everybody knows Patty and Lynn. Mm -hmm. I figured I, I didn't recognize you over there. I didn't right, recognize the other gentleman down here, so I didn't want to put a face to a name. So uh, Next, we're going to approve the minutes. From, uh, oh, I'm just telling Mary she's okay. Yeah. She's a baby. <laughs> uh, approve the minutes from October 5th for the for Frontier. For, yeah, Frontier. Uh, people who were not here, Keith, Cindy, Bill, and Lynn. Any questions about the minutes?
We have a motion. Motion. Second. I'll second it, I guess. I can chair, so. All in favor? Okay, and uh, for the uh, Union 38 minutes? Okay, second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. All right, so moved. Yeah. Uh, there were some people not here last time, but they didn't. Um, they weren't the ones who just. Uh, okay. Next, uh, any public comment out there? And I told them that none of them could leave. Oh, boy. <laughs> Ira, I present to you an award tonight for being a member of the school committee for the past several years. You're kind, you're honest, you're considerate, you're intelligent, you're supportive, but most importantly, you're in it for the kids. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate you and how much I'm going to miss you. Thank you. Speech. 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's all about the kids. It's yes. a privilege to do this. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Yes, sir. Eric. Darius Modesto, principal of Frontier Regional. Bill Marapizzi. I think we could get into a competition who has the largest heart and who is about the students here at Frontier. And you'd, you'd be the winner or you'd be in contention for winner for that. He brings his heart to every meeting. And, and really that's where he leads from. Um, and I want to appreciate your three years of service here at Frontier and all the other things outside of the service at, as a school board member. He's involved with school events. Um, he's constantly talking amongst the community to support Frontier. And I just really want to thank him for all that you've done. And I hope you continue to do outside of it. Thank you. So Bill. Thank you. Do you have anything to say? Any, any other public comment out there? Okay, we're going to do some new business. Uh, presentation update uh, district wellness procedures. Sarah Mitchell. Oh, there's a few of you. I'm and sorry. My, and my colleague, Kristen I'm so, I'm Gordon. Yep. It's fine. Uh, well, thank you for having us here this evening. We're going to present um, the new wellness plan that we talked to you about um, at the last joint meeting. Um, we have been working on this plan since September. The way that it evolved was in 2005, the federal government decided that all schools needed to have a wellness policy in place. And so at that time, Frontier complied with that regulation and put a policy um, together that was approved by this committee many years ago. There have been changes that have happened to that set of procedures throughout the years and originally the procedures and policies were all clumped together and we had short-term goals medium-term goals and long-term goals um, we decided that it was time to really dig into that um, policy again and to revamp it based on the current research um, so we put together a very small committee, as we talked about last time. It was uh, Kristen Gordon as an elementary principal representative, myself representing uh, secondary, and um, Meg Birch, who is in here this evening, who is representing the nurse leaders. And we put together a draft, uh, which we then rolled out in late December, early January, to a much larger committee that included um, a health teacher from Frontier, an elementary PE teacher, um, a couple of parents, um, Mary DeLusa from the cafeteria, 
And then in addition to that, we also uh, underwent a pretty extensive review process. Um, the PE and health teacher health department at Frontier looked at the um, plan and we also rolled it out to um, some elementary folks as well so that we could get as many voices represented in what we were writing as possible. So the wellness plan is right here. There are a number of changes and uh, Kristen's actually gonna go over the goals that we went through, but um, just for example, uh, mental health was not on the radar um, back when the original policy plan was developed and so we've got a mental health section in here now. We also separated the policy from the plan so that the last time it was all one big document. This is actually the plan piece. There weren't many changes to the policy. Um, Lynn will be taking that up with the policy committee and I'm sure as one of your future meetings you'll be approving the slightly changed policy. But there really wasn't a lot to be changed with the actual policy. It was really what we're, we're planning and um, putting forward. So if you could turn your attention to page two where it says goals, I'm certainly not gonna read those to you, but I just wanted to tell you the categories that we um, came up with and are throughout the plan. The first three goals have to do with nutrition. The fourth goal has to do with nutrition education, which is obviously so important. Uh, goals five through seven, physical activity. We want our kids moving as much as possible. Goal number eight, school-based wellness. Goal num goals number nine and 10 are social, emotional, and mental health. And again, we thought that was a very important um, portion to put into the plan. 11 is health education. And 12 is staff, staff wellness. As we know, um, the wellness of our, of our staff is hugely important to student achievement and student growth in all areas. So I know that you'll all spend all evening reading this, um, before your bed, of course. Um, but if, does anyone have any initial comments or questions about the plan? Uh, I don't see anything here relative to bullying. Is right, there? so the district has a separate anti-bullying policy and procedure plan, which is separate from Great point. We want to make sure we cover it, but it's separate right. from the I just want to make sure that yeah, it yes. doesn't get overlooked. Very comprehensive plan. Okay. Well, I, I'm aware of that, but I just want to. And it's sure. also on page eight in here. Yeah, it is in there. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Can I just ask about the smart snack nutrition standards and the effect on um, like sporting? Um, you know, like sports teams that, that do fundraising or food selling during their sporting events, not just football, but volleyball, basketball, that kind of thing. And then, like, how, how is compliance, like, how do you gauge compliance with those standards? And how do you communicate those standards to people, to the, the kids and the parents that do that type of fundraising? Yeah. It, that's a, it's an area that we're continuing, we continually work on. It's a challenge. Um, because probably there's not going to be a lot of sales in the salt-free pita chips. Um, and so trying to find a balance between um, the products that are going to sell and the products that are really truly healthy for you is something that we're continuing to work on, we continue to talk about. Um, I don't think we're going to see an immediate elimination. It, we've come a long way. We used to have um, food snack tables outside of the cafeteria actually competing with the cafeteria sales and it was not healthy at all. And so we've seen the elimination of that. We've seen some of the um, fundraisers move in the direction of healthier foods, but I don't think we're gonna be in 100% compliance right away because I think that until we can find something that's a viable fundraiser that's going to work, that's also healthy or a non-food item, um, you know, there, there's reality also that we have to consider. Yeah. We talked a lot about that, um, and we decided that it was very important to have it in the plan to show that we support that. But yeah, to it, it's really hard. I know in my uh, city, the the mayor was demanding that booster clubs, you know, we'd still we would sell dog bones and things like that. I remember having a conversation with him saying, Mayor, Mayor Burrito, with all due respect, I'm not going to get a lot of money for the cross country team with dog bones. But <laughs> it was a start. I thought about it before I planned a fundraiser. What, what's Mayor Roberto going to say? So if it's out there, maybe, um, maybe, uh, maybe people start thinking about it more. That's our hope. 
Is this going to be incorporated into a into like a separate class, like part of the curriculum that you're teaching it? It's, or is it yeah. So there is a there's a pretty extensive health education piece in here, and that's something we have four years of health here at Frontier, which is a lot more than a lot of other area schools. That's one area that you see cut over and over again. So we have two courses, seventh and eighth grade, and then also ninth and tenth, uh, health one and health two, and there are extensive nutrition sections incorporated into those courses. I've um, I've seen in I don't know if we ever even do it in this country, but I've seen in other countries where they the kids actually get involved in the cooking process and it's part of I mean the, the, like the lunch and yeah. and it's all you know part of and here we have a problem with and it's getting better but um, you know getting kids to eat our food in our cafeterias mm -hmm. but could it ever be do you ever foresee you know uh, part of the curriculum where we could make lunch and get the kids involved in the actual cooking and serving such a great idea and we did talk about it. we talked about having cooking classes and various other things so we, we have yeah. and I think Mary has been so open to new ideas that um, she's willing to try you know lots of different new innovative pieces like that um, um, they, they can be because we've had we've had students um, from our life skills program actually go over and work in some of the cafeterias. So I think there probably are regulations around it, but I, when we have to check that out, obviously, but um, I think there is a way to do it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, some of our favorite times. Review of the Frontier and Union 38 calendars. Yes, sir. All right, so. Um, oh, hold, on, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Yes, Mr. Decker? You want to talk about the calendar? I want to talk about that. Okay, you want to listen to what they have to say or do you want to wait for questions afterwards? Okay. <laughs> so we want to. So what Thank we you. wanted to do is just um, present the calendar and just highlight some of the changes that are in the calendar to draw your attention to them. Um, so one change that was made, uh, we've we've heard a lot of uh, different feedback over the years, and one challenge with elementary uh, parent-teacher conferences was the amount of time that the conferences were spread out over. So one child in the classroom of 20 students might have their conference on the first day, and then a month later, the last child in the classroom is having a conference. And so we added in a half day to try to consolidate those uh, parent-teacher conferences so they would happen over a shorter period of time. Uh, we did reduce the number of early release days from 25 to 21. Uh, to compensate for the fact that we were adding a true half day um, into the calendar. And um, we had quite a winter this year, as I'm sure I don't have to tell you. Um, so we um, have elected to eliminate early release in the months of January and February. So we will reduce the uh, um, chance that we'll have an early release on the same week that we have a snow day. So that's, um, other than that, there aren't any other significant changes to the calendar this year. Hold on, Damien. Mr. Decker's first, he. Mike deals with the school committee conference, or I mean the school calendar, okay. The school committee calendar, that's okay. David? Uh, actually, one um, thing I do see is the start of school. Last year, we started school we on the Wednesday before my knowledge is correct on the teachers union. We step the earliest we can start is Wednesday. I think you're correct due to the, the contract. Um, and I think last year we did it and it seemed to work out. I mean, is there any objection to that? I and mean, I kind of like the four day weekend of Labor Day. And I mean, I would even, I don't know if it takes a waiver or a letter of agreement with the union. I would start it even earlier, say on Monday. I mean, school's getting later and later, and we get all we get all these snow days. You know, it's, we're almost getting into July by the time we get out. Um, yeah, 
I think it's a valid point. I think it's a valid conversation to have. Um, I think we reverted back. I'm, I don't know, Lynn, do you remember some of the conversations we had around that with? Yeah, um, David, that's a good question to ask. What, what we were discussing was that parents and, and some school committee members were concerned that we would have school for two days and then have a four-day break, a four-day weekend, and that um, for people that have to procure daycare, it's very hard. They have to pay for the whole week to be able to have Friday. So they have a Monday, Tuesday, and then um, they come, the students come to school Tuesday and Wednesday, and then they have to go back to daycare on Friday. Mm -hmm. And so when we looked deeper into it, and we looked at the teachers, uh, the CBA, the teachers' agreement, it says that the teachers do not, and this is both, not just Frontier, but Union 38, the teachers do not report to work before the last Wednesday in the month of August. So we follow, we decided to follow that protocol that's in the, the, the contract now, and at the same time, uh, help the families that are looking for daycare and uh, Yeah, I mean, I guess I still see it as a broken week. I mean, you still have to find, no camps are going on that week in August, so you gotta, mm -hmm. you still gotta find the Parents are still able, cover. if they really want to, they can take their kids out like, for the four day weekend if they have plans or well, vacation yeah, plans. Yeah. Uh, I was looking at it from a two way street, trying to get done earlier in June. Um, so in other words, asking the teachers to come to school, uh, to start on Tuesday and then have Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? Yeah, or even start on Monday, so, so school starts on Tuesday. So then we get three, we actually would get three, three school days in, we get Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, but then maybe the union would be open to it since then they would still get a four day weekend. So what I would do in that sense is recommend to the unions when they go to negotiate next year their new CBA, that that would be a discussion that right. Uh, right now we just want to follow the CBA. Right. Okay. Anybody else have a question about the calendars, about early release days? Um, one question. Okay. November, am I reading this right? It's early release on Friday, half day on Monday, full day off on Tuesday, and then back to school on Wednesday. So the kids would only be there for sort of that half day on Monday, and then they'd be off for the rest of that time. Was there a certain strategy there that you were thinking about? I think, I think the only thing that came up, and maybe Lynn, you remember, um, could comment on this, but I think the motivation was to get the parent-teacher conferences clumped together. Mm -hmm. So they don't I think that, that I think that's, that's, that's the motivation for it. But yeah, it just seems like a bit of a throwaway yeah. morning that yeah. But maybe there's another way to think about that. Yeah. Um, it's just a comment that thank you for January and February, and I totally support that, but then we have three snow days in March. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and March is like yeah. March is like a, a calendar of red, you know. Yeah. So just saying. Yeah. <laughs> the line, but that's Anybody else have any in. questions? Yeah, Thank you. Um, I have one question. I have a question. Sorry about the calendar. Um, with the early release. They get out at 1.30, was there ever any discussion about maybe having half days? I know teachers have said something about not having enough time to get everything done they want to get done. Is it working out at the 1.30? I was going to ask that question too, or we were half day thing, calendars and all that yeah, what, programming. We, we did have half days um, several years ago. We had um, half days, and all of them were taken by parent-teacher conferences because we didn't want to have so many in a month or a year. So we had pretty much one per month, and they were all for parent conferences. So we didn't have any of this time. So we tried to reduce the amount of release time and maintain having time for professional development. So that's that was the challenge when we used to have half days. We had we didn't have any left for professional development. 
So that that is yes, teachers would would like to have three consecutive hours, but we would have to have them more frequently to have parent conferences and to have also parent professional development. So I mean, if we have maybe less early release days and then a, like have some half days. Then that will be an expense for families because we cannot provide free childcare for a, a complete half day. Yeah. Um, so one of the considerations was how can we manage this with the faculty we have without burdening families with the cost that they would have to go to the half day of, um, of out of school time. And it's a wonderful program, but there is a cost associated. So we were trying to balance the needs of families to not have to incur that cost while trying to maintain as many school hours as possible, while trying to also ensure that we had enough time for parent conferences. So it was a, it was a balancing act in that way. And not, and not to throw it in, but it's a loss of revenue if I don't, we don't serve lunch. That's a concern. We, we, we want to have as many lunch days as possible. I would just add that if the teachers are asking for a certain thing, it might be good. I mean, that's something we really want to pay attention to. That they have, they're the sort of reason we were doing the early release for the professional development. Mm -hmm. So if um, if they are, it would be great. I, I'm sure you worked with them in thinking about this, but I think we want to make sure that we're, we're listening to what they're bringing up. Bob, question I have: We're going to continue to allow the children to stay at the school on early release days until three o'clock. That, yes. that that is not being eliminated. That's still going to be there. That's still it. Yes. Move the calendar. Frontier. Second. All frontier. All in favor? So moved. Move the calendar for Union Thirty Eight. Any other discussion? Voting members only. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Not unanimous. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Let's talk about the school committee calendar. Yes. Okay, can we, uh, you want to start talking about it first or you want to hear about it first? I'll hear about it. Okay, I'm to it first. Um, we can, so the school committee, um, the school committee calendar mirrors what we did this year. And if there's any um, questions or discussion on changing it, that's fine. We just need to agree. Bob? Well, the school committee conference starts the morning of the 7th of November. Frontier is going to meet till at least 9 o'clock that the night before. And on the 7th, the Deerfield School Committee is scheduled to meet, and that's the, f the first full day of the conference. So I would suggest, you can do what you want, is I think the, uh, the Frontier meeting can either be moved to the s from the 6th to the 20th or to the 13th, and let the Whaley meeting be moved to the 20th. Uh, and Deerfield should be moved from the the seventh to the fourteenth would probably work out. I think that's what we did this year. Right, we moved yeah. it. I do. I think so. I went back on my old um, actual the calendars I yep. hang up in my office. I didn't see where that happened, but there we moved so many this year. I know because I know. of snow and every other thing. Well, I know I went down the day before, and, and I, I typically don't miss a frontier meeting. <laughs> So then that would, if we move the frontier from the 6th to the 13th in November, then that would mean that Sunderland would have to agree either to do it the Tuesday of Thanksgiving week or the 27th. I think we just should move us frontier to the 20th instead of screwing up. Okay. That's fine. Sunderland's, I mean, unless somebody else. This, just last year we moved the Deerfield one to the, to the following week. Okay. So, um, we need a motion. Yeah, we need a motion for Frontier, and then Ken needs to write down if there will be a motion for the Deerfield in November, and then if there's any other dates or months. I can move with either the either the uh, 13th or the 20th, whatever the board wishes. We want to move it. Well, 20th. 20th. 
Somebody's on the So I have a motion move in Frontier from the 6th to the 20th. So is that so administratively, is that, I mean, that we meet it jointly on the 4th of October. Now you're not seeing us again until the 20th of November. Is that a problem in terms of signing things, bills, warrants, things? That, that's a long time, that's six weeks. Not unless you change the rules. And then you're seeing us two weeks later. Because there's nothing I that, that, I mean, Tuesday's not written in stone right. either, is it? No, but we're going to go from the 20th to the 11th. There, there's no reason we can't meet on the 12th on a Monday. Mm -hmm. I don't care. Yeah. That's fine. You know, it just seems to me like to me a, a lot. Make a motion. So the next one is old. Is that a holiday? No. Make extent. a motion. That's the, the we're out four nights. Well. That's 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 big deal. Right? That, 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 that just means we're out four nights that week, but that's no big deal. We can suck it up. Veterans Day. Is that Monday? 11-11. Oh yeah, the 12th would be Veterans Day. It is. We have our November meeting in October. the 12th. On the 30th. 14 is open. But no, he wants to move the 7th oh, to the 14th. That's what yeah, the Didn't you say that, Bob? Uh, yeah, was, but the 14th take. Well, that's Deerfield. We're going to move it. Yeah, yeah right. we we're hoping to. Not if we go first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are. You are. Your promotion's on the table, so. What prevents us? Why again is the desire to move Frontier from the 6th? So Bob can go to the. So Bob can go to what? Is, what is <laughs> the conference? What does that, what does that do with the conference? The conference starts at 10 o'clock the following morning. It's two hours away. Or what airplane do you drive? <laughs> you might just have to tough it out, sunshine. Or not come, Buff. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever you want. I don't care. Okay. I'm just saying that. It seems like it's, it's tough trying time. to find a date for one person. Well, we typically I, meet on the second Tuesday of the month. Type. And this, for some reason, yeah. it, it has moved, been moved around. Uh, because of, I think because of the Thanksgiving holiday mm -hmm. being in that week for Sunderland. We moved everybody up a week. We moved everyone. We moved both Sunderland and Conway up a week. Would, uh, would the Sunderland committee entertain having their meeting here at Frontier on the 13th at 6? Starting the Frontier meeting here on the 13th at 7? Or backing up, why don't we just have it on the 8th instead of the 6th? Camp. That's no, still still the camp. You're still at the cake? Yeah. When do you come back? That oh, we're going to miss you, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> we're going we're gonna to leave, leave Frontier alone. Well, we have a motion. You're going to take your motion back. You're going to take your motion off the table, sir? Give her a second. I think it was. Yeah. Oh, it's drop. We have a question over here. I'll get my Uber driver to bring me down. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and no one from Sunderland going down to the leaving Tuesday night to go to the MASC? Either that or they can drive the next day. They seem to be doing so. They're more youthful. Well, they have these. They're more youthful. Hey, Bob. They have the hey, Bob. conference of the uh, regional school right. meeting. No, I have to uh, early on Wednesday morning. Okay. I get it. I get it. I make a motion that we flip the 6th and the 13th so that Frontier meets on the 13th and Sunderland meets on the 6th. Second. Seems like the any, other mo any other yeah. talk from Frontier? Sunderland seems to be able to. Of course, as long as Sunderland doesn't mind. Yeah. Any questions from Sunderland people if we, sw we flip flop it? Sunderland people? As long as Bob brings us, you know, donuts or something that night, then we'll, we'll, we'll be mad. Okay. I'll bring a six pack. <laughs> All in favor, Frontier? So moved. Thank you. I'll need a motion from make a the motion. union. Make a motion to move. Deerfield's meeting from the 7th to the 14th. Well, do we, no. So no. we can leave no. Deerfield unless Seven. you don't mind. You don't mind driving. No, it's. I mean, oh, no. I mean, this is for the. We need to move Sunderland from the 13th to the 6th. You're make the motion. I'll make the motion to move it. I'll second it for, for, for Sunderland people. Thank you. All right. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? We're unanimous again. Thank you. Oh, and now Trevor's got to move the. Uh, yeah. One for the no, I'll Trevor. I'll make a, <laughs> finally, I'll make a motion to move the 7th. Uh, Deerfield from the 7th to the 14th. Okay. I'll, I'll second. Thank you. 
Any other discussion? If not, all in favor? All right. Opposed? Abstentions? We're clear. Unanimous again. Thank you. Now we need a motion to accept the calendar as is from Frontier. As amended. So as moved. As amended. amended. Sorry. So moved as amended. Second. Any other questions from Frontier on the calendar? All in favor? Opposed? Abstain? A motion to approve the union calendar as amended. So moved. Seconded. People, people are already voting. <laughs> Trevor and David. Okay. All in favor? Yes. Aye. Opposed abstentions were unanimous again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Can we revisit that? <laughs> Don't shake your head. No. <laughs> Just because at Frontier, if you remember, we need to pass the budget by the 11th of March. Is that correct? Remember, we got into that little thing this year, and we're meeting on the 12th. So if we were to move our meeting to the 5th right now of March, we wouldn't get into that quandary come January of next year like we did this year. It's a good catch. Yeah. Very I good apologize catch. for not catching it earlier. So I'd like to make a motion to move March's 12th, meet the date of the 12th of March to the 5th of March for Frontier. Second. Any discussion from Frontier people? All in favor? Thank you. Thanks. Just accept that. Thanks, Cindy. You're welcome. Very good. Okay, we have we have a few policies that we've been working on, and um, everybody had a chance for a first reading. <coughs> um, We've been having lots of fun, cookies and donuts, you know. Um, there's a, there's a, I just want to let everybody know there's a lot more coming. Um, I'm not sure how you want to go, you want to go individual and go on individual work, individual? Yeah, you have well, to vote no them individually. Oh, there's no voting. Did you vote in the individual meeting? In the vote in the individual meeting? Yeah, you don't have both meetings. Oh, yeah. Did you suggest that those are all going to talk about this? Yes, we need to talk about So we're going to, Lynn's going to, we're going to, we can talk about individual ones in a group and then we go back to our regular meetings and we'll both form at our own, our meetings tonight. Say that again, please. We're going to talk about the policies here. And, and then when we later. break away, yes. we'll have we'll go down in our individual meetings. So you have to make a declaration that wasn't reasonably anticipated we were going to talk about these in this Union 38 just to cover us. Well, it says policy second reading discussion various policy changes, is it there? which is number yes. D and number five. D okay. and five. Oh, all right. Thank you. Yeah, we're fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. No. I just want to make sure we're getting in trouble. So the committee's been, actually we've been working really hard and the committee members are, Phil Cantor is the chair of the committee, Bob Decker, Mary Raymond. No, I'm not on it. Oh, excuse, excuse me, Bob Holla, Mary Raymond, and uh, Bill Marapizzi, and Greg Gottschalk. So we have had some very rich conversations. The question I have for you right now is, when you looked at these, they were presented last month, and you had a kind of a month to read them. Are there any questions on any specific one, or I, I could just go through them and, exp I, you know, I don't know how many of you have copies of them. Have you all read them? I have okay. Does anybody have any questions on any particular ones, Cindy? You have any particular I, ones? Um, just the the whole issue of the longevity. I was just trying to find it. Um, and my concern was that the longevity, while it's extended for several years, and do you know what, what one that is, by the way? The longevity one? What policy it is? It's not, it, it's actually in GB and it is GB1. In GB? And these are the uh, Union 38 and the Frontier Regional Policies and Procedures. And they were, uh, one was adopted or amended in May 12, 15, and the other one was December 14. The only thing in these two policies that we're looking at now is just increasing the longevity to begin 
not FY19, but FY20, because our budget for FY19 is uh, set. The uh, impact for the first year looks to be about $4,500, and that's across the districts. So um, central office would be $1,000. Um, people, we have three people moving from $750 longevity to $1,250. And these are 32 years, 27 years, and 25. Conway, two people at 17 and one at 16, moving from 250 to 500 for a total of 750. And those will stay in place for five years. Deerfield, one person, 21, goes from 250 to 750, and that's uh, $500. Waitley, 29 years and 19 years, uh, 250 to 1,000 and 250 to 500. So that would be $1,000. And then Frontier Regional, uh, 43 years, 29 years, 26 years. They're all getting 750 and they will move to 15. The 43 year old uh, person will move to 1500, the 43 year service years. Uh, the, uh, the other two will move from 750 to 1000 uh, for a total of $1,250 at Frontier. All told, the district will pay about 4,500. What we have done is move from, uh, we had 10, 15, and 20 years. People at 20 were stuck at 750 for the eternity of their uh, service to the district. We, uh, the policy committee vote, recommended to add um, 25 years, 30 years, and 40 years. 10 years is 250, 15 years is 500, 20 years is 750, the new ones, 25 years, 1,000, 30 years, 1,250, and 40 years, 1,500. Okay. So of, of the new steps, on the new steps here, there's only one, two, three, four, five people out of all this. Some of the, some of the people that Lynn talked about we're on a regular step program for the total of $4,500. Phil, you want to go first? Well, I just wanted to add that this was the one policy uh, revision that there was not uh, unanimous support within the committee on, but there was a unanimous vote to bring this forward and uh, uh, that, that, um, that, that when there's a desire to give uh, or, or to specifically reward, I mean, the genesis of this is that there was a desire to reward excellent service in one employee in particular. And the feeling was that this was sort of the only way that we can really go about doing it is to float all boats similarly situated. Um, which, which um, and the, but, but when you look at, uh, when, when we did a survey of what other schools were doing and what all of our neighboring schools were doing, the increases are much more in line with what the neighboring similarly situated schools are doing than what we cu currently, we are, when you look at that from that comparison, we are low. Um, but the, the uh, and, and the, other, the other drawback to that is that when you put budgetary requirements in policies, they're sort of below the surface level. And they're, on t they're basically, uh, it's difficult to ever do anything about them in the normal budgetary context every year. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, God forbid if we are ever in this situation where every thousand dollars really, really matters, um, like, like or, or you know, do you have to fire a teacher or like, you know, whatever, then, then this is something that theoretically would be better positioned maybe if it was, it, it, um, in a position where we could do something more with it in a budgetary context and we're, that we're not really going to be able to. But so those, those were kind of like all the arguments pro, pro and con, like, but this would bring us just normal to where everybody else is. Um, and in context of the other benefits <coughs> issues, that's, that's kind of where we were headed to is uh, trying to just be more normal. There's a few, take out our, our low outlier and take out our high outlier. and make us more normal. I, I have a hard, hard time with this because we, we don't reward our general town employees with this large the longevity. So 
the schools take a huge part of our budget every year, and it's very tough. We try to play, f be fair to our employees all across the district, uh, all you know, all departments of town, and um, not that I don't reward excellence and longevity, and I, I get all of it, but we are struggling to find every penny to fund education for one, um, and then you know, just adding this on on top of it when it doesn't compare with the person who's worked at the highway garage for 30 years. They don't get $1,500 longevity. So it's hard to, it, I have a hard time not being equal across all boards when education takes so much of the town dollars as it is already. It's hard to be, just I have a hard time not having it kind of as parallel. And I know it might be parallel between different educational facilities, but between town employees, it's very tough. In the town of Deer, Deerfield, right? Mm -hmm. what, where do you, where does your steps end? At what at what ten, step? We have ten steps. Ten steps. Ten steps. We just redid is it our by classification years? study. Um, it, it is. You you typically would like to bring them in at step one or two, depending on their experience, and then each year as they gain access, they get up to step ten. After that, they'll stop going up steps. Um, we'll do a cola depending on the year. This year we did a 2% COLA, which was hard for a lot of people to take in town because it was a tough vote. And again, so it's, it's a lot of money. If you move a step and then a 2% COLA, um, but people, when they get to the top, they don't move a step every year. They get a longevity, or if there's a COLA, they get a COLA. So, but the longevities are more in the 500 range. Maybe is, thousand. Is, is that, so step 10 in Deerfield, how many years do you usually have in at step 10 oh yeah. is it 20 years for step 10 it could be yeah i mean it, unless you adjust the classification schedule and they drop back down as a couple of steps but pretty soon they're back at 10 again right. um so i'd probably just want to compare it a little bit more Bill, i had a, a three-year ongoing battle with, and i agree with you completely because as an employee from the town of waitley i had been there near, near to 30 years yep and people were getting in the schools were getting I was getting nothing, right? Because none of the town employees in Waitley get anything. Now they get two hundred fifty dollars, no matter how long they've been there. But it was it was a three year struggle, struggle mm -hmm. with them, to, uh, with the town town fathers to find the money to pay for employees. And you had guys, and I, I was the newbie among the group. <laughs> well, at that time, I had twenty five year service because the guys in the highway department had more than I did, and none of them had ever gotten anything. And there's some, there's some pretty big numbers in here, and I would guarantee you they'll be hollering and waiting. Because mm -hmm. yep. I'm, I'm retired now, but that doesn't mean I can't holler. Mm -hmm. right. yes, yes, yes. And, and, it, it and you're not afraid to hire. And it doesn't oh. take a fact, take away the appreciation we have for that service exactly. and, and wanting to, I'd love to give it. I and I never worry, worry about how I told it to the cycle a hundred times, and I'll tell it to them again. I'm not advocating they think the longevity away from the teachers. No. I'm advocating that there be equity for everybody who work who work for the same entity. Yes. Our payroll is printed by the same same bank. It comes from the same amount of money. We all work for the same entity, but we don't have the same benefits. Right. Blaine? We model appropriate behavior by setting the tone here uh, for how you should treat your long-term employees, and maybe the town will follow. The, the, the problem is finding the money. Right. I mean, that's the hard part. Right. But. You know, and you and also, because it's seventy percent of our town budget is education, seventy yeah, percent. Yeah. It's a huge chunk. Yeah. We have no money left for highway department, police department, all of that. I mean, just the increase this year alone it, 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 in what we can raise in taxes is getting eaten up by education. So it's far, it's just I agree with I I want a reward. I, I would love to. I don't know where to find the money. Problem. Well, my concern is. What particular employees qualify? Only those that are at will employees, non contracted, and non union, correct? This is non union, yes. So, custodians, I mean, secretaries, cafeteria workers. But it would not apply to uh, IAs or teachers because they're covered under collective bargaining agreements. And it wouldn't apply to other staff. You know, the higher principals would apply. No, no, they have their own contracts. Okay. I just want to clarify that the only people that are included here are the, basically the clerical and the janitorial. Right. And the cafeteria. 
Cindy? Um, when I brought this up last month, my concern was that we should never make a policy based on a person. We should make a policy based on her sentence and how many people are going to get to 40 years of employment somewhere. Did you say it, it, how many years and you now get 500? You wait? Yeah. Everybody gets 250. 250. Doesn't matter if you've been there for 10 years or 110. Well, my original thing was to say that I thought we should raise the 10 year up to 500 and just get rid of all the other ones and leave it at 500. But I do believe that to be true to our constituents and in our selectmen, maybe we should follow that model. And yes, encourage them to come up a little bit. I mean, I don't know how many years it's been like that. This seems that it was approved in 2014. So I'm gonna assume that it wasn't, you know, 30 years ago. But I do believe that in this case, all employees should be treated equally. You know, what is equitable? The town people work just as hard as school and school works just as hard as the town. So I just think that all these steps, it's, it's, we're, we're targeting people, and we shouldn't be doing that. That was my original thought. Yes. Just briefly, um, you know, I was part of some of the, the back and forth, too, and to uh, maybe an additional perspective. Some of the reasons why you would have steps is because turnover is expensive, and someone who's been around for three years maybe is, knows their way around a little bit better than someone who's just hired, but not as well as someone who's been here for six or seven or eight or nine or ten. Um, that argument does start to kind of fall off. As someone who has been in a position for 35 years, necessarily more valuable to the community than someone who's been here for 10, it's something that for the committees to, to talk about. Uh, to what extent does the step level represent value and your desire to retain people, or to what extent is it just kind of a status thing that the people are going back and forth? With? And I don't know either about what, what the situation is in the other towns. What do you just have steps there? So you get the code that the finance committee decides to give you, if they decide to give you one. That's that. There are no steps. There's no place to go. Wait. So the employees are particularly sensitive to things like this because they have, there's nothing else. I don't know how it is in some of the town. Everyone knows the steps in Deerfield, but I don't know how the other ones are set up. But wait, is not set up. Does anybody else have any questions about the longevity that we're talking about? I, I guess my my question to the superintendent would be, as as we did discuss policy GB um, in our various. Uh, school committee meetings after this if one town decides to support the new longevity and another town doesn't what does that do to the union 38 personal policies and procedures does it have to be unanimous across the towns or does it have to be individually voted in each town uh, yeah with definitely each town but with frontier it would have to be Frontier Committee right. voting that. <clears throat> yeah, it would probably have to be each town because it would be in each town's budget. So it would be up to the union 38 towns. So we have the potential. That's an open question, though. I don't think that that's, uh, we, that's not a, 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 there's, that's not an answer with a degree of certainty. That's, right. that's an open question. So Absolutely. should we table it and get more information before we make a decision? I think we can certainly make that motion in our committee meetings to table so that we have clarification as, as we continue the discussion. Yes. That's right. As being one of the members of this, this committee, um, and, and there was some sensitivity here, what we try to do looking at GB and GB1 was trying to look at the differences between the two, and there was differences. If everybody has seen it or not, if you haven't, you gotta look at it. There's quite a bit of differences between one and the other one. Some are better here, some are better over here. And we talked about <coughs> this particular thing, trying to pass this one, and then to have another subcommittee just to talk about GB and GB1, try to bring it together as one 
and still keep it as two, but have it all the same language. So when you look at vacation time, sick time, you know, who gets 10 days a year, this classification of people, this one gets 15, this one gets 20, how many can you save, how many you can, how about the buybacks? You know, it's, you know, if we talk about buybacks for, we're talking, no, no, I didn't mean to shut you off. No. I just wanted to be recognized afterwards. Yep. So um, just so you know, I'm going to make a motion that we table GV and GV1 at Frontier. Second. Until it, no, well, we can't do it now. Don't we have do to vote on that later? Do it in the meeting. But just so everybody else knows, up front, transparent, that I just think that maybe we should align this a little bit more. Yeah. And, 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 that's, and, we, and we discussed it. That's what I was trying to yeah. say. We, we did discuss, you know, if, if things didn't pass or if this one passed, then we were going to have a subcommittee just on these to try to bring everything together uniform between the two of them because there's some good on the unit 38 and there's some good on the frontier one and we talked we, we saw the differences and stuff so so to, to be clear gb1 is the frontier non-union and gb is the union 38 non-union union 38 non-union gb they have 10 years 250 that's it the other uh the frontier has 10 15 and 20 years um, going up in 250 increments, 250, 500, 750. And we wanted to add them for both. And so we can, and we can, you know, if we take, if it, of all the committees table it, and we have another subcommittee to talk about just these two, mm -hmm. then we can, like I said, we could try to get it more in the line and then we either bring it forward this year or be something for next year, but. Phil? So the, you should, the, the GB and GB1 take, have taken up the majority of our time so far as a committee. Um, and we tried to look at them sort of holistically, um, that it's not just a legit GB, it, it's also the sick pay um, and the vacation pay. And what we really tried to look at was the, was the one thing that upsets town halls and the taxpayers at town meeting the most, which is line items on our budget for forty thousand dollars for retirement, and they, they find out there's one employee that retired, um, and, uh, and and you you will you will recall that um, before we hired a superintendent, we we addressed this um, before we hired the, Dr. Kerry. We we addressed we addressed this uh, sick pay issue and. Um, uh, the, and specifically the ability to cash out your sick pay, uh, your unused sick pay at the end. And, then, and um, this is totally separate from vacation pay. The sick pay traditionally uh, is not a cash benefit. Uh, it's a form of whatever, whatever, whatever else it is, it's not. And, and, and there's a lot of uh, nuance in all of that. But um, the, the, when we looked at the policies that other School, uh, schools have for all their employees. Um, most didn't have any ability to get cash for sick pay at all. And so we looked at it from, we have a, depending on whether it's Union 38 or whether it's Frontier, it's either one and a half days per uh, year of accumulated service you can cash out when you left or two days of per year of accumulated service that you can cash out when you left, when you leave, with no cap, with no upper cap. So that you, we have, you know, non-union, um, uh, uh, whatever, the custodial, whatever you want to call it, but the, uh, positions that are when when when, at, when they cash out thirty or forty years of sick, it's big numbers. Um, and so when when we did talk about this in at least one of the union negotiations that I was at um, three years ago, the last contract time. The, the 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 response was well look you give this benefit to all of your administrators and you give this benefit to your non-union people how could you talk about taking this benefit away from us first and I thought that was a very coherent response um, and it made you know and so the, the first thing that we did we've been on this sort of journey now we've we've worked it with the the, the administrators now that have been hired since that time I do not have the ability to cash out the sick pay like that and. This is the attempt to take it to take that premise to the non-union personnel, um, and, and the reason that even though we, we knew that there was a need to like uh, have a special subcommittee on this stuff, um, but 
the, the more we wait, I mean, every, every single, this really applies to new employees, we would hope. I mean, that's the purpose of this, is to apply to new employees. And in this category of employees, we're, we hire every month. So when we, the longer we wait, the more it gets baked into the system, our inability to change it. So, so the, the, the longevity, the giving in the longevity was sort of to be balanced against the taking in the sick pay. Um, even though they're not directly comparable, it's sort of they are a little bit. Um, and uh, does this make sense to anybody? Uh, no. <laughs> Oh. I understand where you're coming from, Phil. You're yeah. trying to have one wash it. to eat. We just want to review it. So, yeah. um, and I think it's worthy of it. Yeah, even I, though I'm not saying you didn't do a great job. No, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go. I'm okay. going to go out a little, little bit. But, but I'll go out a little bit on the limb and say that I think we've got a pretty good grasp that GB and GB1 probably need to be tabled for further discussion. Are there any other policies before we break? Because we're at 7.30, we were all scheduled to be into our meetings by 7, and I, I know we have, what's that? Yeah, I know we do. Um, so I'd like to keep the meeting moving along on the agenda. Are there any other policy questions that people had? Um, these are great questions, but go Trevor, ahead, Trevor. One question on authorized signatures. One thing that came up in town was, uh, Barbara was asking me if we, um, in town, if, uh, say, Selectman can make a signature and then bring it back to uh, to discussion later at a meeting for warrants, and uh, we did that at the collaborative as well. Um, we had a committee to come together, and so a few people could sign and then bring it back. The, the issue came up when we had uh, we bumped the Deerfield School Committee meeting, I think, three times in a row, and it was like six weeks before we could sign warrants. So I was wondering, I didn't fully read this, and I apologize, but I wondered if that addressed um, section DGA, did it, uh, it said authorized signatures. Was that in there to, to uh, you know, so a committee could vote the chair to sign in absence of, you know, all of us coming together at a meeting? Does that sound familiar, Patty, uh, at all? So what we wrote was the chair of the school committee, uh, of Union 38 school committees, or designees will sign warrants presented for approval. Great. And then Frontiers uh, says the treasurer and the assistant treasurer are authorized to sign check withdrawals. Perfect. I think so that will address, I think, what we had for an but issue in town. You don't have any warrants in Union 38 to sign. We have, we're have. Yeah. we presented with warrants at every school committee meeting. Oh, yeah. no, 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 Union 38. Well, it says Union 38 Oh, Union 38. Schools. Yeah. Schools. Union 38 schools. schools. Oh, sorry. Yeah. All right. yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Any, any other policy questions? I think we need to get moving along here. So. Okay. Next uh, superintendent's report. What I have given you is my my um, computer. Whatever the network would not print my superintendent's report. So what I wanted to speak about tonight very quickly is. Um, Tomorrow we're going to, uh, Keith uh, McFarland and myself, we're going to uh, Senator uh, Representative Stephen Kulik's uh, office with uh, attendees from Athol Royalston, Amherst Pelham, Gateway Regional, uh, Gil Montague Regional, Hampshire Regional, and Mohawk to discuss um, how we can go about trying to get our regional transportation fund 100% funded the way the law states it. Right now we're at 70 to 80%? If that. If that. And uh, so we really want to advocate for that. This is the reasoning why we're going. I won't go into it all, but it talks about why transportation is a focus, why we really would like to have 100% reimbursement in the FY19 budget, and um, there was some, uh, there was a study done. There was a, a report done that we all received. Uh, and this is what is leading us to go there and ask. Uh, two Saturdays ago, I attended the <coughs> Sustainable Rural Schools, schools and, uh, but there were a lot of town people there too because they have a big part and a big <coughs> investment in our school's uh, budget. So we met and on a, uh, at Greenfield Community College for about three hours and to discuss 
and to listen to presentations about what we can do together, uh, the rural schools and the especially folks in Frontier, um, Franklin County, uh, to what we can do together to move our needs or our to advocate for some kind of relief for our rural students and our budgets. And that was quite interesting. More to come on that, the sustainable rural schools. T uh, next Tuesday, I'm going to Massachusetts uh, Association of Regional Schools for their general meeting uh, to talk about, again, where we're moving on with the rural schools and what we can do together as a portion of the state that is not really receiving the funding we need for our rural schools. And that's what I have. If you have any questions, if there's any questions about that meeting at Greenfield Community College. Great meeting. There yeah. Was, there was, uh, you know, Representative Paul Mark had uh, posted it. Um, the Hart Foundation was there, and they were, they were doing a lot of advocacy. They were looking at Chapter 70 funding and um, the makeup of, of that Chapter 70 funding and how some, you know, some towns uh, can certainly pay their fair share. They can pay all their education. There's no need for state funding like Wellesley or something like that can pay it five times over, um, but still get a percentage. They have a 15% cap, um, so the state will pay them 15% of their needs anyways, um, even though they don't need it. And um, so we're, I think there's gonna be a group together looking at that chapter 70 funding and that cap um, because there is a fear in Deerfield uh, would would be on the opposite side of that and we could lose even though you know we're not a very wealthy community but we do um, I think we we do over you know we overpay um, and we, we don't get enough money back um, but but there is a risk that we if they if they redo that and pull that money away from some of the wealthy towns and it's based on income and it's based on zip code so we could we could lose some money so it's important to study that and this all came with a band yes. <laughs> so the background music background so music for my comments so we're, we're trying to these coalitions are trying to attack it two ways through the regional transportation and as well as the chapter 70. Yep. we only received 20 dollars a student this year increase in our chapter 70. Not enough. It's just not enough, and so we really are. What, there's there's a group that's working with it, and this district, our uh, Union 38 schools, and our regional school are working on it as well. And then we all have to move on. Uh, 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 I just want to make you aware of the fact that some of us that are here tonight attended the reception for the incoming uh, Minister of Education, and. Uh, he strikes me as a fellow that's more hands-on than a pious person, and that you can probably relate to him more so than you know some of those people that typically held those jobs. And there's others here that may want to add more infinite wisdom than I do. But did anybody talk to him about charter schools or anything like that? I spoke to him about um, the inequity of funding between school choice and charter, and he really wasn't aware of it. He comes from uh, Charlestown, where he's a principal, and then Lawrence, where he's a superintendent. So he seemed willing to learn. Um, but the, the main driving point I try to make to him that there's complete inequity between those funding sources. And I wasn't trying to attack charter schools at all. I, didn't, I was trying to take any money for them. I was saying school choice should, should actually match that rather than just the $5,000. And then in this meeting tomorrow, um, the agenda part C, other advocacy, advocacy ideas, I'm going to bring that, that idea as well. Anybody else have anything? No, I thought it was a nice presentation he made. He talked for quite a while. He's currently the administrator of the uh, Lawrence uh, High School, Lawrence School System. He was put in because Lawrence had failed. Right. And he's the caretaker, much like Hoyoke has a caretaker. Mm -hmm. so, Great. Whatever you want to call it. Yep. Same thing. So. But he lets the school participate. <laughs> So. Okay, um, next on the agenda, we'll, we'll be going into executive session. So everybody that's that's not a school committee member has to leave for a little period of time. Well, why don't we take a five second break? There's enough people here that maybe we, I don't know if people want it, we could go to that room. Is there enough room in there? 
why do people need to hang around? Or, well, that's a question. Well, that's a question I can't. Answer. When we go back in open session, we have people here that want to talk to us at Frontier Regional when we break apart. And you so. have to have your school committee meeting after. So if, if everybody except for school committee members can temporarily temporarily go outside, we'll come get you when the meeting comes back in open session. I love inviting you. We need to go. Yep, I we need to move. Session only voting members? Everybody. everybody. Motion. Everyone can go to executive session. I need to the school committee You need to declare order. Is everybody here? Yeah. At 843, <laughs> please. Um, I'd like to review the minutes from March 6th. I'll keep minutes. March 6th. Do I have anybody want to talk Welcome about March 6th? Second. I got to look and see where they are. Who wasn't here? Um, Mr. Decker and Mr. Bill, um, who wasn't I here? We, I think we should wait for the super. Oh. So somebody can take notes? Well, I am. I was going to take notes because if you had a close. No, no. I just wanted to set the other uh, districts okay. up. So Mary um, Mary made the motion to accept the minutes, and I seconded them. I have to go to the other meetings. Right Is that right, Mary? Are, are we any, other, any other? Do you want me to talk about? Any other questions about the minutes? All in favor, except for Bob and yep. I Bill. Yeah, I was here. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm abstain. <laughs> Feel Mayor Peasy. <laughs> yeah. I can, oh, yeah, I thought I was there. I can't find Calmy's folder. Everybody but Bill. No, it's in the box. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Financial. Here you go. Ugh. Okay, so tonight you signed 25 warrants. Totaling one million four eighty-eight seventy-nine dollars and forty-two cents. Thank you for that. What's coming around is our, our where we stand right now with our school lunch program. We are up six thousand one hundred and twenty-nine meals from this time last year. Our participation's up from thirty-nine percent to forty-six percent. Our meals per service <coughs> hour went from six point six in June to ten point two in February. Um, we are still operating at a loss because we had the one-time consultant come in, but if we were to remove that, th this time last year, we had a $34,000 deficit. If we removed the one-time cost, we would have a deficit of $1,416. So we are on track, moving in the right direction. This does not reflect any group insurance costs that we have? No, Bob, it does not. It's well, just our... So, it, you know, if we have a cost accounting system, we ought to be able to track all of our costs. We don't charge by department health insurance costs. But, but we, I don't. There's no utilities here. Oh, well, maybe we should that, have that costed in too. And and then maybe we need to hire an accountant who can do that. Well, we have an accountant. No, we don't. Where, where's the rest of the consultant fee located at? Uh, it's on the bottom, the fifty thousand five sixty. Right. Where's the other twenty five? That's it. That was that was. Frontier share. Oh, so the consultant fee got pawned off on all the other schools too? No, the, the schools that shared the, the the food service director who was here previously didn't get pawned off on anyone. It was that so that Sunderland was their agreement. And Deerfield and Frontier paid. Sunderland, Waitley, all of them, and Frontier paid. Not Conway. Right. They I thought were. Conway adopted it. They no, they're they're sharing in the new food service director. They did not share in the old food service director. Thank you. But they sh shared in the person who developed the plan going forward, so they should have shared in some of the costs. You don't know what you're talking about sometimes. Seriously. No, I'm serious. Flory didn't work in the, in Conway. Why would I charge Conway for what Flory didn't go there? They bought into the program she designed. And now no. they're paying. And now they're paying. And now they're paying. Does anybody have any other oh, questions? Yes. Okay. No, what would you like? Not on this, but I have a question on the financial statements. There is a charge there for retirement. Uh, we have a negative figure under the, re the expense retirement, uh, a negative figure of $25,000 we're carrying. Correct. And I've reported that every month since September that we had to stop charging it on the grant. It's been on the variance report that Mr. Marapizzi has asked me to have every month. But this is just a, a straight even dollar that 25,000 the grants used to carry $25,000 of our 
our Franklin County retirement assessment. They, we can no longer do that. The federal law does not okay. allow us to do that. All right, it's not a, anything else. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Uh, public comment? Uh, sure. Yeah, just give it to him and we'll pass it right around. Okay. So, um, we have two. Lever, lever. Sure. Um, my name is Paul DeMarco, a resident in the towns of Shootsbury. Um, one of the things we wanted to talk to, and we're hoping to address to the full joint committee, uh, because we have annual 38 teachers here as well as frontier teachers and other educators, um, is that um, the unions are sponsoring a showing of a movie called Backpack Full of Cash on May 2nd at the Academy Theater, uh, Academy of Music in Northampton. It's about how charter schools are bankrupt in part public schools and taking the money and creating a two, two-tier system of education. Um, but the main thing I came here to talk to you about tonight is um, I shouldn't keep a copy for myself of that. Yes, please. Thank you. So I'm handing out a spreadsheet with more numbers. I know you guys are just looking at numbers. I'm sure you look at a lot of numbers. Um, but what? No, I'll wait till these get around so you can follow me. So. I assume everybody here is aware that the Hampshire County um, Group Purchasing Health Insurance Trust um, is changing its plan design. And by that, I mean they're raising co-pays and deductibles um, this year. And we've just gotten the most recent um, financial report from the Hampshire County Trust um, as of February. And the trust, if you look at the, um, well, actually, if you look at five lines down, it says add from general on the right-hand side, the little note there. Sorry, I didn't write these. This was one of the uh, trust members I got this from, and they had been written notes on it already. You'll see it's an even million-dollar figure. The trust was able to take a million dollars out of its operating revenues and put it into its stock portfolio over the past year because it's actually shown um, $1.5 million in operational profits this year. It's gained $1.5 million from the revenues it brings in over the expenses it's been paying out. And if you look at the bottom line on this sheet, you'll see last from last February to this March, the trust one, I've got it backwards, but it's 26 million and some odd dollars on the, on the February bottom line to 30 million, 30 million and some odd dollars. Sorry, I'm not looking at it. Um, the trust, that's the trust net, net assets have grown by $3.5 million over the past 12 months. Um, so we didn't come to you with this before because we didn't have this information before. Um, but if you look on the next page, uh, you'll see the, the, this information is summarized. This, um, this information was put together by our, we have a, the Massachusetts Teachers Association has a uh, healthcare consulting firm that we work with called Boston Benefit Partners. And they put together this, um, this page, which shows that the trust had um, $1.5 million in its operating revenues increase. Um, and showed a re basically a $129,000 million, $129, um, profit on a monthly basis, average monthly basis. And you, each, each one of those is the monthly profit or loss from the trust. And, and profit and loss is not a technically accurate statement. The trust is a nonprofit, um, but it's the easiest way to describe it. Um, so if you look at the bottom, there's the total reserves again. Um, the 30, it's up to 30, 30 million, 101,146. This means that the trust is funded with reserves as a per percentage of annual expenses at 46.8%. In other words, it's got 50% revenues. If, the if every town and school that was part of the trust right now went bankrupt and told the trust, we're not giving you another dime, the trust wouldn't have any insurance anymore, but they would have what they call IBR. It's, it used to take three months for um, medical bills to come into the trust and they'd have to plan, make sure they have at least three months of reserves in order to pay the bills. Now that everything's electronic reporting, it's a lot shorter than that, but we wouldn't recommend the trust have anything less than three months on hand, because it's, it's gotta be safe. In fact, I think three months is too little. But right now, the trust is close to six months on hand. Um, that 46% of years. So on the next page is um, just a, a smaller spreadsheet, comparing the um, percentage 
of the um, trust re the trust revenues I mean, trust assets um, now as which is the 46.8 percent that I showed you before um, and the thing I didn't should should have pointed out earlier is the cost of these plan design changes the increases in copays and deductibles are a way to shift the cost down to the people who are the insured um, and that it, it, overall the trust is saving a million dollars from that plan design change it's not a million dollars for frontier or for union 38 it's altogether it's a million dollars so if you look at what it would happen if the trust did not pass that cost on right now they would still have um, they would go from 46.8 percent um, rainy day funds to 45.2 percent of, of rainy day funds they'd be still overfunded Joe Shea, who's the director of the trust, has said at several meetings, in fact, he said it two weeks ago when I was in Belchertown, the trust is overfunded. I understand he wants to keep the trust flying at a level playing field, and we don't want to see the trust go bankrupt. We saw Amherst being poorly ma mismanaged um, just recently. But right now, if the trust is making a million and a half in profits over the past year, it doesn't need to throw a million dollars in costs on the people. It can afford that. So what we're asking is that the um, Frontier School Committee and, and you as residents of your towns um, support that your towns and the Frontier School Committee representatives um, please vote at the next trust meeting, which is at April 12th, to, um, to suspend the rules. It's going to be run by Robert's Rules. You guys must be somewhat familiar with that, being on committees. Uh, to suspend the rules to allow for um, reconsideration of this proposal to jack up the co-pays and deductibles. Um, if, if only just to allow the debate to happen on the floor. Um, we know there's, I know there's several towns and communities that are in support of uh, reconsidering and not doing this. Joe Shea will certainly be there. He can present the numbers. He's the master of numbers far better than I am. Um, but we'd like to at least bring it to debate. And I, I know you guys can instruct Patty um, but if you could also talk to your select boards, I think you have some waiting in your towns. Um, they listen to you. Um, if we could get just at least the debate on the floor, there's still time for the trust not to do this. In fact, it's easier for the trust this not to happen as those people who've been in negotiation, the one IAC meeting we've had so far, pre-negotiations. Um, you guys won't have to come anymore. You won't have to deal with me. Um, make my life easier and yours. But really, it, it will save, the members will tell you the impact on, on them and their families and their coworkers that these changes are gonna have. Um, but it also save frontier money. Because right now you have to pay an additional 25, you have to add an additional 25% at least under the law to what your premium payments are um, as a result of the negotiations with the unions. So you'll save 25% on your healthcare premiums by if this is overturned. So we're asking that you instruct your representative to the trust to please allow the debate. And if it makes sense, support um, not passing on the premiums this year. So I, I'd like to, I know I took a long time, and I'm sorry, but it was a kind of complicated dance to explain. But these guys are here. They're the ones who are directly affected, and some of them would like to tell you how it's going to affect them and their members. Or their coworkers. Hi. Mr. Bill? Yeah, I, I am. Hold on. I am on the Insurance Advisory Committee for the Town of Whateley. I'm the retired employees representative, and we've had two meetings so far on this very issue. And yeah, we met yesterday, at, yesterday afternoon, and the representative of the teachers union, representing the teachers that was there, the Town of Whateley, we have a tentative agreement to go with the changes that have, that have been, that the, the selectmen voted to accept the changes of, of, the, of the GIC, the trusted Waitley, and uh, the units that were in that meeting, I was representing the retirees, and the teachers, Emily was representing the teachers, they have voted to, to go along with the proposed changes of the plan. So, if any, any, any of the um, member units of the trust, they call them, have adopted these, um, uh, negotiation agreements that will become moot. There would be no need for them and it would just not exist. So if the, if the trust reverses the plan design changes, 
these, these agreements would just go away. If the plan, yes. if the trust yes. does that. Yes. He has a bad app. Sorry. So just to, um, Bob, is it okay if I? Oh yeah. Yes. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, so, to ask, uh, I mean, just hear that's important information to hear from from Bill. Um, the, um, what we're being asked for tonight is to allow, the, you know, the the district to go and support voting no, which is what. Yes. Happened last night. It's, it's, it's no, actually, exactly it's, the opposite. It's oh. actually, it's actually okay, that's another. why I'm asking the question. Sorry. It's exactly the opposite. Whaley is voting yes. But all we were we, we were doing as a committee is taking the the, the twenty eight thousand dollars that twenty five percent of the twenty eight thousand dollars savings in Whaley is seven thousand dollars. How it was going to be divided among the thirty one subscribers in the town of Whaley. Oh. The savings that the town of Whaley was going to realize from the changes we went. We were. Given all the changes, the changes in the deductibles, the changes in the co pays, everybody saw what each one was going to be. The okay. town was going to realize $28,000 in savings. The, town of Whaley. the law requires 25% of that money be returned to the subscribers. Okay. So this, the 31, 31 subscribers to the town of Whaley's plan are going to split the $7,000. And so, I am. So okay, I, hold on for one second, okay? We are going into executive session to talk about. The trust okay so i rather hold our comments to them this is public comment what's what's let's so have give them the public comment later on we'll we'll, we'll be going to executive session to talk about the assurance advisory thing thank you i was okay. trying to understand yeah so just to clarify they came they came before us tonight because there's public comment so mm -hmm. so just to clarify that so there's a formula that the under this law that the the changes to the the, co the plan design, copays and deductibles, they add that up the total value of that by each unit, town or schools, and they say that you have to give at least 25% to the unions in those towns or schools. If the trust says no increases the copays and the deductibles, that um, $7,000 cost to the town of Waverly just goes away. The, the $27,000 cost to Frontier which is equal to 25% of your quote unquote savings would just go away. Um, they would, they wouldn't, it would, the trust would pay for it out of that 1.5 million, it would actually cost them 1 million. So that's what we're advocating for. Um, and it would, and that's how it would save you money. If, from our perspective. If, the, if, I, if I, I don't, you know, the public comment was great. Oh, and sorry. I, I just don't want, Everybody talking about the same thing. If you have a couple more people that want to talk, it's fine. Um, five minutes. Try to hold it to five minutes, if you could. Sure. Hi, I'm Steve Leiter, and I teach math here at the high school. Um, and so I won't go over percentages, but um, you know how it would affect us. Um, the Immediately off the bat, we spend 200 more on if you're at family plan on a prescription, and if you were to get admitted to a hospital, it's 500 more than what we pay this year. A uh, single test like a scan is another hundred. You could easily see a family uh, incurring an additional thousand dollars in costs, um, uh, and that would not be hard to imagine in a family with kids. Um, uh, so the plan impact to us. Um, if you're on a family plan, could could easily be a thousand or more. And um, you know, as Paul said, from our perspective, if we can reverse the trust's plan, and it would save us money, and we believe it would save you money, it would seem like um, kind of an easy decision from our perspective. So thank you. Thanks. If there's no other public comment, we'll... thank you. Thank you. Uh, point of order, Mr. Chair. Uh, did you say we we're going to do this in executive session for the revised agenda? And just why is that? Why can't we just talk about this? Oh, is there a state secret insurance trust? Um, I, 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 I think the collective so. bargaining sessions with the insurance advisory committee. I think, I think originally, may I? 
I think originally this was put on the agenda because we are in negotiations regarding what's to happen with the excess money. Since then, there's been a change in approach by the by the association to go after the trust itself and to get them to change. So originally, when this, when this agenda came out, that was not the topic that was going to be discussed. It was going to be discussed that we're in negotiations to talk about what was going to happen with the within the new agreement under the new um, GIC proposal, which, you know. So since then, earlier this week, there's been a change in the direction that we should be looking at the trust and the trust is holding too much money and the trust is doing things inappropriately or however you want to say it, and they want us to put pressure on the trust. So it's different when this agenda came out last Friday, that was not, I'm mean, looking at you, Lynn, it, it, would you agree? We were talking about the fact that we were in negotiations regarding this and to get everybody up to speed of what was happening in those negotiations. And, it, and we had a meeting on Tuesday, it didn't go very far, and so we are here. So it would sound like the reason for going into executive session is now moot. We should just talk about this, deal with it, let's get it done. I have it as an executive session. Yeah, we would go into executive session to discuss <coughs> Well, that's not, like it, it'll be, like it'll be, burgundy. it'll be down towards the end. Okay. Okay. There's no student advisory person tonight? Okay. That's uh, uh, Fair and unusual is, punishment, I think. Right? Huh? Unfair and unusual punishment, right? Next is Frontier Regional Building Renovation Subcommittee. Um, I have, the best one goes down. And goes down. Where are we at right now with the subcommittee? And I asked the, any of the members on the subcommittee to jump in if I go astray. Um, we're continuing to talk about different funding options. Um, one of the things I need from folks tonight is I'm handing around a contract that I need to have approved by this committee to go um, we, uh, I talked about him last time, Joe Markarian from FERCOG has been come on to us as a consultant. Um, and we need to formalize our relationship with him through a contract. And as you can see on the contract that I'm handing out, I know it's still making its way around, but I'm gonna keep talking anyways. Um, we're looking to spend up for the year. Our uh, calendar plan is to have this complete by December, the end of December. Um, he is looking to, well, FERCOG is looking to contract him out to um, not to exceed $5,000 in services to us. Um, he doubts it'll reach even that high. We do have a line item in the current budget to pay for that, that we saved on Patty Left. So I'm gonna make the look it up. Um, finance professional services under expenses, financial pro professional services, we have $13,000 in that account. So we have the money to pay for it. It was voted 8-0 in the subcommittee, both select the four select boards and the four members on this committee voted for it. We think that his, his input is invaluable. I, and I, I'd ask any of the other members of the, the subcommittee to He's the bees either knees. agree or suddenly disagree. He's the bee's knees. That guy is like the municipal yeah. finance. Wow. He, he, he served, uh, served, he uh, worked for uh, 20 years with the Department of Revenue for 30 years of the Department of Revenue, some astronomical number, and then he's also working on uh, consulting these kind of projects dozens and dozens of times. His job is just to assist us, it's not to direct us, he's been very clear about that. Um, and I think the fact that we, with our select board and the many different opinions that are on that um, subcommittee, do all certainly agree without, without pause that we should hire him on um, to do that. I, and to be honest, I'm not sure we could do it without him. So, <laughs> how's that for us? Yeah, I agree Question. with everyone. So I need a vote, so then I'm going to Bob, we have to sign off on the contract. Yep. Yep. Vice Chair. Darius, I thought we agreed with a different date than June 30th. He's got a June 30th on this. I thought we talked about We did. Did I hang out the wrong dated one? It says June 28th. Mine's yeah, mine's June 28th. Mine says June 30th. But the scope award says December 31st, sir. Yeah, June 275. They sent me a revised edition that says December 30th. I have it. So the one that will be signed off on, so if everybody could go to that where it says schedule, third paragraph, it goes from 225.18 to, that should say 1231.18. And I have that copy somewhere, and I'll go through my notes here to find it. That you have to sign the correct okay. one. We moved. But it was, originally it was for the whole year. Will we authorize the chairman to sign the contract? Second. All in favor? All right, thank you. I'll get you that copy, Bob, and we'll get that signed off. Other than that, there's no real, it's late in the evening. 
There's different scenarios being talked about. We're going to talk about it again at the next meeting. He's already got um, new numbers to hand out. At that point, when we have a little more time, we'll go through and, and start talking about the direction we're heading. But I think people are full there, and I'm not really prepared for it. So how about that? That's all I got for that, unless anybody else from the committee does. Thank you. Anybody have any questions for a few of us that are on the committee? I mean, the guy from the <coughs> Franklin County Cog is very knowledgeable. When you when he talks, it's like your head pops and listens to him because he's he's full of knowledge. And if he doesn't have the answer, he'll he'll get it for us too. So he's the former selectman in the swamps. Okay, we got policies next and votes on them and correct me if I'm wrong on every one except for GB-1 that we're going to table for now correct do we need a motion or uh, I will make a motion to table GB-1 second. second Bob any other discussion on tabling it all in favor All opposed? Abstained? Uh, I'm just asking. I didn't yeah. see your hand go up, so. No, I, I, I would deal with it now. So okay. I would oppose, I guess. Yeah, opposed. If I have to be, if I have to vote. That's all right. You have the right. So not on. So, so we have all these policies. Uh, our committee's done pretty good we wish we had more for this vote you know um, if you got any particular questions you know the good thing about it Lynn did present them we talked we made changes came back the next meeting we were trying to meet almost weekly to come up with these um, I know one night Mary and I were all by ourselves we didn't have a quorum but that's all right I want to hold it against you guys but if no one's, I mean, I'm not sure if we can just group them together and just vote them all at once. Oh, I think you can. Okay. Does anybody have any other questions about any of the policies other than GB1? So I need a motion to accept. Move. Second. Call it question. All in favor? Thank you for all your work. Thank you. Um, new business. Update, update on the proposed sale of. Christian Lane, the blue school. Good news there. <clears throat> Your chair so you can speak. Good news there. The bids are officially opened. We got one bid. The bid. The oh, bid. The bidness. The bid. And it was more than zero. <laughs> so uh, that's our, that's, that's, that's how we feel about that. Um, yeah, the, the, it, uh, the, yeah, not much. Oh. <laughs> That's public. That number's public. The well, number's public. So, so the bid was $1,000 $1, for our parcel and $1,000 for the Waitley parcel for a grand total of $2,000. Because both parcels are together because, remember, so that we don't own our own septic. <clears throat> Waitley owns our yeah. septic. They just own the septic. We own the built with. So, How do we feel about that? There's, so There's a proposal for units of housing that goes along with all the things. Yeah. It's going to turn the school into 10 apartments. The school is 10 apartments and then there's another building with... Uh, wow. What, what our subcommittee voted tonight was to notify the town of Whaley that, that uh, we have an offer and that uh, their uh, contract or deeds, restrictions and buybacks, and they have a first right of refusal. We have to give them notice and if they choose to buy it, they can buy it for the bid plus a dollar. So a thousand one. Yeah. Let's okay. hope. Okay. So, uh, but we haven't made any other recommendations at this point. It's not the same guy, but if you're familiar with what they did with the Montague Center School. Yep. Think. And so the thing is that it's not it's not like to be evaluated against a perfect like oh it would be great if we could get a hundred thousand whatever, but it's sort of like what's the alternative if. If, if we don't. Yeah, and that is like having a dead building and having a huge insurance cost every year. Um, I mean, there's still, as a group, we, do, we, we know, as Patty would say, there's still cost. We, she's estimating uh, how, how, how she's getting it, but she's estimated it's still about a 
forty thousand dollar cost approximately that's what she was saying to get rid of everything that's inside there whether it's digitizing records um because there's a lot of records in here for all the schools we love it if all the elementary schools in frontier had a separate room that would take it all that would be a big chunk of things but they're again asking the schools for a particular storage area it's kind of tough so we're going to have to figure out digitization shredding after doing that i mean that i mean it's it will add up how long does it take to purchase that building if everything goes right if, if we accepted that 90 days are we going to be able to get that stuff out of there in 90 days depends on how bad you want to get it out you could do it you just well, gotta we spend have money to, right but yes. we don't have any money budgeted That's, to yeah. do anything there we go current year nor uh, unless you take it out of uh, school choice or one of the revolving accounts but that's just going to leave us a day down uh, short for the following year i will i will vote whatever the committee thinks because i do not have enough knowledge to say we should keep it or we should sell it anyway let's um, see what the town of waitley says because right. they're going to have to vote at a town meeting so they get to they get to get it for a dollar more than asking yeah so but they the also step. have to They're vote still having discussions about that's one of the few pieces of recreational land there's a ball field there yeah. that they have the town doesn't have a lot of room so they've got to work that thing out for themselves so they can so buy it from us for a thousand one they can so okay. we talked any so fred was approval. there today right. and fred brought up the same thing about the ball field and i said fred it's a ball field that for probably kindergarten kindergartens first and second graders play for softball supposedly there's still ten thousand dollars somewhere for the rec department to upgrade a field we got a, a perfectly good field over at the elementary school that's not being used plenty of parking in the back and i bet you for around ten thousand dollars or a lot less they could put in a first and second grade softball field for first and second graders or third graders the other the older grades use that field too my daughter so for our terrible. purposes i won't huh it's terrible yeah but for our purposes we don't care what they do with it we care that we follow process right mm -hmm. okay. yeah. so, so, we need so their selectmen their selectmen haven't even seen it yet except for fred or talked about it. i think they're going next wednesday next wednesday night be the first time they'll they'll talk about it well, i hope they buy it they're not going to the they're meeting. not going to mm -hmm. no because it's going to be uh the, the too proposal, expensive the proposal to is going to be eight to ten thousand dollars annual tax revenue for them there you go they're not going to buy it yeah. because they're going to they're going to assume the same kind of problems that we we've assumed not going to happen okay thank you any other discussion about it okay uh, school choice recommendations. You should have it in your packet. Um, that's very similar to what we've seen in years past. Um, in the high school, we, we can easily take in 10 in each grade level. We don't get that except maybe in ninth grade. We can, I think last year we got about seven or eight into ninth grade. Um, the grades above that, that's just a number. We'll get one or two for each grade level. Um, the middle school, um, you know, um, looking at eighth grade, um, the numbers are a little bit larger. So, you know, we're looking at up to five. Again, that's probably about what I get normally for school choice around that. So if I had six, I'd probably take all six that kind of thing and you guys have given me that range before if you look at seventh grade we talk about that number if you look at the number below it says 126 that's not a realistic number to the class command i'm predicting based on past year's numbers that we're going to be around 105. so i can i could easily take it says greater than five i could probably take up to 10. we'll see how those numbers as i get the numbers updated from the elementary schools of who's as they find out because the way it works is they don't have to really tell us so mm. it's kind of by word of mouth until the enrollment happens at the end of the school year. So they're going to private schools. They really don't have to tell us until they're gone. So we, we do get pretty good information from the teachers and from the school. So it's, you know, it's not like they, it's not like signing day that they, they have to declare where they're going. Do they ask for like records before they go to their They'll class? ask for records and that's usually the, thanks, Bob, that's exactly what happens. They ask, that's usually the indicator. Schools aren't asking for records yet because we're still making them. Right. You know what I mean? And so that's the, so a lot of it is word of mouth. So we get a, we'll have a greater idea and as we get, 
as that number lowers, I add to it with school choice. We probably have a half a dozen to probably six to 10 in seventh grade waiting for an approval to, um, to come. So as you know, it's, we're big choice, big choice school. And you know, the sooner I can let them know, which I will do after this meeting, especially those who've already applied, um, I will do so. So that's basically where we're at. You know, I'm not gonna be pushing that number, um, you know, certainly above 115. You know, again, um, in the way we break up the classes, it's still classes of under 24, under 22 at this point. Um, could even be under 20 if that number goes below 105. So. So I'd like to make a motion to, um, I recommend school, school choice be at the discretion of the principal. Is that proper? Second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Um, I have nothing. Collaborative have? Yeah. Uh, we have meeting the other day. Long. How was the food? Food? Well, yeah. I didn't really care that much for it, to tell you the truth. You know, I like my food. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we had a, made me hungrier. a yep. uh, good, good turnout, and uh, the uh, executive director went through his uh, evaluation and all of his exhibits and, and what have you, and it's very extensive. I think that uh, he could write a handbook for executive directors uh, based upon what he's got in there for all of his, all the information and all of his exhibits and stuff. It would be a good handbook anyway. And uh, other than that, we haven't done anything more relative to real estate since the last time, and uh, that's where we are. Anybody have any questions for Bob about the collaborative? No, just thank you for doing that. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Hopefully it'll be better food next time. Well, we're going to be in uh, Greenfield next time. Oh, good. We were in Northampton the other day. Perfect. Darius, do you have anything else for us? Yeah, let me just be quick. Um, you, know, you guys can read the other ones, but I just wanted to, for the kind of the public record, um, I just want to thank everybody for the, uh, who participated in helping out with The Wizard of Oz. Um, David Peck, Melissa Strelke, Denise Sittler, Max Sherrill from the staff. And the amount of parents and community members that stepped up. There was this was the biggest show that we've had at least the ten years I've been here. And the attendance was through the roof. Um, it was just impressive overall, and it was just a takeoff from the musical last year. So I'm just very proud of that. And the other thing I wanted to kind of highlight is that um, we selected our Teacher of the Year, our Winston Award winner, Mr. Chevy Sini, um, who teaches high school. Uh, chemistry for the most part and other high school sciences as well and she's well deserving and she'll be honored at the annual dinner at the log cabin I think I wrote on April 26. So those are the two highlights that I want to make sure I got the camera at 920 something. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Okay we're going to go into executive session. Um, MGL C 38S 21A2 to update committee on collective bargaining session with the insurance advisory committee. I don't think it's going to take too long and Allison, we'll see you later. You guys, we'll, we'll come get you. Are we just coming out in Jerry? Likely. Yes. Okay. 